grass withers and the flowers fade. All right. We're in the midst of a very difficult conversation between Jesus and the Pharisees. And with these Pharisees, you see that they, they really do like to do a balancing act. That they want to just land in the exact right spot. That's why their behavior is such a big deal, and their internal attitude's not such a big deal. I don't know if you've looked around Chattanooga lately, but there are a couple of things that keep popping up that just don't make a whole lot of sense to me. Uh, there is there are all these stores now that just sell cupcakes. Has anybody seen like like were we in that much need of a cupcake? Were we in cupcake desperation at some point? And not only do you have the cupcake places that keep popping up, and every cupcake place has bigger cupcakes than the last cupcake place, we quit calling these cupcakes at some point. They become just cakes. You've also got these frozen yogurt places that keep popping up. Like they're everywhere. What's wrong with ice cream? What is wrong with ice cream? But we've got these yogurt places, they're everywhere now. You can't drive down Gun Barrel Road without being sprinkled with some kind of stuff. You've got the the cool frog, and you've got the is that what it's called? But it's still cool. It's it's frozen. It's cold. So you've got sweet frog, and then you've got the cool swirl, and, and then there's a place beside them all, Minchies. That's probably my favorite of all of them. I'm being honest with you. But you go in there, and the other day when I go into Minchies, they've got uh, this sign up, and, and the sign was. Oh, really, it's a balancing act because you go in there with your little kids and Shepard just makes weird stuff. He's like, I'll have birthday cake flavored yogurt with gummy worms so, and Oreos. But the lady, and here's what was on the sign. It says, the weight of the day is 11.4 ounces. If your mix weighs this much, it's free. They don't let you wet once, though. But I'm just standing there, and I'm looking at that sign, and I just keep thinking that that's us. We've got this idea, and the Pharisees have this idea, that if I land in the exact right spot, then everything's going to be perfect. But if not, then I'm in real trouble. So they do everything they can to land on that spot. To make sure that all their I's are dotted and all their T's are crossed and all the things that they can do to make things look just like that is there. And I've been honest about it the whole time. I believe if we're not careful, we miss that we're very much like the Pharisees in these stories. We, we play from a different perspective because we're after the life of Jesus. We wear jeans and not gowns for the most part. But we look and we see that what most of us do, our understanding of Christianity and our understanding of faith is not one that says great grace, amazing grace, abundant grace, full mercy, freedom in Jesus. Like those are the words we use, but we play the spot. You stand on the spot. Make sure that everything weighs right. I remember being a little kid, and I was at church every Sunday. And I wanted to do church right, and I wanted to make sure that I was, I was nailing it, that I was sticking the landing, so to speak. So our envelopes, we, we had the offering envelopes, and I, I was dropping a quarter every week. But I would look, and I, though I'm dropping my quarter, I, there's a list that was there of things that you could check off. And I don't know what the intent of that list was. I don't even know if they still do that list. But in my heart, my understanding of what it meant to follow after God and to love God was about much more than, than me being able to trust this super mercy that God has shown me. My idea of following after Jesus came down to this. Am I checking things off the list? Bible read daily. Right? Offering given. Sunday school lesson study. These things that you just check off. I don't think the intent was to make me a legalist, but it made me a legalist. And that's what you've got with these Pharisees. We're going to check off a list. And here's what this really, here's how it unpacks for us. We have an incomplete view of Jesus. It's shallow at times. 
Because here's how we view Jesus. Every time that He says something that we view as loving, that's for us. But every time He says something that's hard, it's about somebody else. Every time we talk about mercy, it's literal. When we talk about difficult things, it, it's that's been figurative and symbolic. What happens when, when this really does eat us up? What happens when, when all this balancing that we're trying to do, measuring things out to the exact right spot, what happens when that collapses? When it overflows because your cup can't hold the 11.4 ounces? We think that Jesus would do what we do, we cheer for who we cheer for, we vote for who we vote for. And there are times that we miss the Jesus of the Bible. He, he's, here's what's going on in the, his relationship with the scribes and the Pharisees. John chapter 8, verse 48. Then Jesus answered him. Now, keeping in mind, he's just told them that the devil's their father, which never goes over well. Are we not right in saying, and here's their reply, because they're not sharp, evidently. He said, your daddy's a devil, and their reply is, oh yeah, you're a devil. Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Both of those are them saying, hey, there's something wrong with you. The idea of the Samaritan here in this passage, we know there's this, this rift between the Samaritans and the Jews, very much like the Jets and the Sharks, so we, we know they don't get along, they're not always on the same page. So they say, you're a Samaritan, which would... In that moment, they have not only pointed out the fact that they think that he is illegitimate, they have also said, we think you're a Samaritan, so there's something wrong with you there. We think you've got, not got things together in that way, in that shape, in that form. And we also think, Jesus, that, that you're, you know, you're just not for us, so we're against you. We're in a different place altogether. This year. You're a demon. Verse 49. I do not have a demon but I honor my Father and you dishonor me. Now, he's still claiming possession to God. I honor my Father, you honor your Father, the devil. I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it and he is the judge. Now, this is not discrediting the idea of the biblical concept of the Trinity. What's being done here is this. Jesus is saying, I didn't just cook this up when I woke up the other day with the disciples. When we were roasting fish, I would just think, you know, I'm going to communicate to them that I'm God. He is saying ultimately, from the very beginning, the purpose and the point is that God is going to glorify Himself through God the Son in the flesh. He's going to make Himself known. He's going to speak to the world. This isn't something that I just made up on my own. I'm right here and that's who I am. And here's what we see Jesus do in the passage. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it and He is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. If anyone seeks my word, he will never see death. And the Jews replied, now we know that you've got a demon. Because you're saying we're going to live forever. Now again, this isn't the first time that Jesus has pointed out the inconsistency with these Pharisees. If we look through Scripture, we find He does it over and over and over. If you hold your place. Let me read to you from what He does to them in Matthew as Jesus points out the inconsistencies with the Pharisees. Uh, verse 23, then uh, chapter 23 of Matthew, beginning in verse 1, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to His disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees, sit on Moses' seat. So practice and observe whatever they tell you. So they're going to tell you some good things, but do not do what they do. For they preach, but they do not practice. We, we've used that before, right? That's our line. They tie, they tie up heavy burdens that are hard to bear. They lay them on the people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. The idea here is what we call hypocrisy. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries, and, and that's not people who like to give large amounts of money. A phylactery is a little square box, leather, that has scripture verses in it. And what he's saying is, when the Pharisees are walking down the road, they've got the biggest scripture verse box. 
When you look at them, it looks like they're, they've got this under control. They're carrying the big box. And then he says this about them. They've got their phylacteries broad and their fringes are long. So they've got these tassels that are there. When you look at the tassels, you would again say, everything about them says, they got it. They got it. And they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. So let's just take some words off of this and we'll say it like this. They love that when they drive down the road, there are things about them that you see and you would say, that person's a Christian. They love that when they walk around in the grocery store and see people who they agree with, they call one another brother and sister. They love that when they're doing the things that they do, they meet in the parking lot on Sunday mornings and greet each other. They love that when they see one another, there is a unity because they have formed this exclusive club. And they love that everyone who stands on the outside of that exclusive club looks at them and says, man, that's what we're supposed to be. While in their hearts, they're sick of them. Because they've created a standard that nobody can get to. Do this and do this and do this and do this. you got plenty of time to do that. I don't. And then you look at the rest of the passage and Jesus drops what we call the seven woes in Matthew. And I'm not talking woe like Joey from Friend Style Woe when one of your friends does something crazy and you text it to him. I'm talking woe in the sense of Jesus says about these people who you would look at and say, man, When you examine them, everything's perfect. Woe means if they're not careful, what they're doing is going to damn them. Because somehow they're missing that all those things, though they're good, they have some good qualities. Jesus even says that. There's a point where it says that they tithe on their spices. Ladies, imagine this morning before you came to church, you had to go to your cupboard, open it up, and get out the time and the garlic, and give 10% of each of those. They tithe on their spices. And Jesus says, but they miss the bigger picture. If we miss that, then it will damn us. Here's the thing about these guys. Jesus keeps dealing with these ideas in John 8, and He keeps coming back to this fact. He's just dismantling for them what their opinion of themselves is. Whereas when we look at him earlier in John 8, we see that he's loving and merciful towards a lady who everyone in town would consider, she's a prostitute. Why? How can he be so loving towards this and so harsh towards this? Because this lady, she's been brought to a point where she realizes her situation. So he doesn't have to dismantle anything because he's already there. So (laughs) these guys, he keeps looking at them and here's what he keeps dealing with from them. They keep thinking that there's nothing wrong. Tim Keller, pastor of a Redeemer Presbyterian church in New York City. New York City says this, one of the signs that you may not grasp the unique, radical nature of the gospel is that you are certain that you do. Any time that this idea of the gospel becomes so common to you that you think, I got that? Whoa. Well, what's Jesus say in verse 40, 49 and 50 through 51? He, here's the words of our Lord. 49 through 51. I don't have a demon. I honor my Father, yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. 51. Truly, truly, I say to you, If anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. They reply, you're saying that we're not going, you're not going to taste death? What do you mean by that? Well, who are we talking about? Who is it that doesn't taste death? Jesus gives an illustration in the book of Luke about about a Pharisee. And in this illustration about this Pharisee and the tax collector, he paints a picture as to what will happen when both of these go before the Lord and deal with the idea of their physical death. Let me just read this to you. Luke chapter 9, actually Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 9, says this. He also told this parable to to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Again, right bumper stickers, 
the right yard sign. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Pharisee, everything's right. We'd like him. If we're being honest, we'd like him. We may be him. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed this, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But this tax collector standing far off would not even lift his eyes up. So you've got this man who stands, he's like, God, I fast twice a week. I take care of my kids. I do everything I'm supposed to do. I don't take advantage of people. God, I am awesome. Awesome. I'm clean. Whitewashed tombs is what he says in Matthew 23 at one point. Everything's perfect about me. I love me some me. The tax collector. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful upon me, a sinner. So both of these men die, right? That's the story. Each one of these men, that don't know what happens in the biblical days. A camel, go, a camel goes chaotic, takes them both out. They both are standing before God, and you've got this Pharisee who's before God, and he just begins to list off to him, God, everything's under control, right? Did you see what I did? Did you see all those things? Did you see my phylacteries? Did you see my, my long things off my head? Did you see those? Did you see how awesome I was? And God's, here's what we do. Verse 14. About the man who had beat his breast because he was afraid to even look at God. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. So when they both get drugged before God and one of them lifts off how good he's been, God looks at him and he dismisses him, evidently. Which is scary. Because it says in this passage, this man went down justified. The one who beat his breast. The one who was broken about his sin. The one who realized he had no place. The one who had to be drug in by an archangel. The one who was just there looking at the face of God with his eyes closed. Beating his breast. It says that man went down justified rather than the other. Because here's the root of it. When you've got this guy, this Pharisee, and he stands before God and gives his laundry list of all of his good deeds, if the guy doesn't see his great need, then the reply of God to him is, who asked you to do any of that? And if we're not careful, we gather together in rooms like this weekly. We say that we worship. We say that we trust God. And, and we give out this list of things that say that everything's okay and everything's perfect. If we've not come to a place where we need, realize our great need for this Savior of the Bible, then the question that God would ask us very simply is, who's asking you to do any of this stuff? I don't need you. We think that God does. Let's keep going in the passage. Verse 50. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets who died? Who do you make yourself out to be? And Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me. So this is something that's from the beginning. And you say that he's your God. You don't know him though. I know him. When we look through the Bible, I've told you over and over in this book of John, we talk about the idea of belief and how it means trust. Here's what you find with Jesus. There's never a point where it says that Jesus believed God. We always see that Jesus says that he knows God. Jesus has experienced God. He knows and these men are there, and Jesus is saying, you say that you know Him, but there's nothing about your life that says that you do. Because you don't realize your great need for Him. 55, if you, but you have not known Him. I know Him. If I were to say 
that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you, but I do know him and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Now there's lots of interpretations as to what that means. One of the very, one of the most popular ones of those is this, that Abraham looked and saw that God was going to provide a redeemer, one who can make you right because you can't make yourself right. And Abraham rejoiced because that, that that would happen. And here's why. Because Abraham knew how filthy and sinful he was. So God's going to provide and God, God's going to do something here? Yes. Here's their reply. 57. So the Jews said to him, You're not 50 years old, which Jesus probably knew. And you've seen Abraham and Jesus said this, Truly, truly, or as I've said before, this is the way it is. Before Abraham was, I am. I'm God. I'm the provision. I'm the one that all those laws that you're trying to juggle, they point to, but you're missing me. The box that you carry, that's really pointing to me. Those, those dreads that you're wearing on your head, they, they point to me. They're me things. And if you miss me, then you miss it. Get longer tassels, that's fine. Get bigger boxes, but if you miss me, you miss the point. Do we miss it? Like really, when you look at you, and you look at you more than anybody else does, do you miss it? So you wake up and you try to be obedient to laws that really have no meaning outside of Jesus. You just see the moment rather than seeing the God who created the moment. You don't see that this idea of glorifying God is bigger. So much bigger. And you just having stuff and voting ways and bumper stickering cars. That's not even a verb, but I made it one. It's bigger than this. Is your faith one that though you got everything completely under control, you, you, you kind of put a Time out. I mean, I just really follow. Is your faith about what you do? If it is, then it's no different than the Pharisee. If we're not coming to the place where we see this great mercy that God has shown us, Jesus shows this woman mercy. Jesus desires to get the Pharisees to a place where they can see they need mercy. Have you come off of your high horse so that you see that? that You need mercy no matter how much you think you've got things together. And there's not a day, like I know some of you guys became Christians in the 60s and 70s, there's not a day from that point forward where you cease to need Jesus. He didn't set you into motion. like, you know what? I'm going to save you back there. You figure things out. One day I'm coming back. They're going to write a few poorly exegeted books about it. Then I'm going to take you home. What we find here is Jesus says, don't get away from the mercy that you need. Because I'm what you need. I am. That's not the first time we've dealt with that. I am the bread of life. John chapter 6. I'm the light of the world. We'll go keep going further. And all we see over and over is this idea of need. Have we stopped our faith so that we don't need Jesus? I have realized that, and some of you guys know this too, your lives when you were younger were not as cool and easy as your kids' lives happen to be now. Biggest amen I get all day. <laughs> and, and your life is easier now than it used to be. Here's what I mean by that. Like when I was a kid, if I wanted to get on the internet, I would walk into a room of my house where this box took up about 82% of it. And I would sit down in front of the keyboard and I would type in my code and I would hear this weird noise. It was called, called dial-up internet. Anybody remember that? And if you wanted to go to a website, then it would take about 45 minutes. Like you had time to go bake a cake. And if you wanted to bring up an image or download a video, you could go bake a cake in Florida. 
that's not how it is now. How many people in this room have a device in your pocket where you can get to the internet right now with a blink of an eye? Right? When I was a kid, video games were different. I mean, here's why. They did not have an auto-save feature. Right? Video games now have this auto-save feature. For many of us in this room, we grew up in an era where that wasn't the way it was. You couldn't even save a game. There was a character when I was a kid, and nowadays he rules galaxies and drives go-karts, plays ping-pong. His name is Mario. But when we were kids, he was a humble plumber. Like, anybody remember that? Just clean toilets. That's what he did. He had a brother named Luigi who did not get nearly as much playing time. So you would play Mario, and I, would, I remember you would run on bricks, you would jump over tubes, your primary enemy was a pizza topping, right? You would play these eight levels, four sub-levels. At the end of the fourth sub-level, you would fight a character named... Don't even act like you don't know, people. Bowser. Bowser looked like a turtle, a warthog, and a dragon had a baby. So, you're playing on Saturday morning. You, you wake up, and I've been playing since 7.46, 9.46. Mom walks in the room. She looks at me, and she says to me, Hey, Chad, I'm about to go to the grocery store, and you need to go with me so you don't, don't burn the house down like you did the last time. I've got a decision to make because I don't have a save feature. Here are my options. I can turn my Nintendo off, and start over when I get home and try to work my way back up to the bullets that have eyeballs. Or I can leave my Nintendo on pause for the two and a half hours that it will take to go to the grocery store to get stuff for our sandwich. The problem with pause is this. If you leave a Nintendo plugged in and turned on for two and a half hours, it gets warmer and warmer and warmer. By the time you get back, you can fry bologna on top, stick it on some bread, shove it inside, and make a panini. So you've got this Nintendo that's messed up, and it causes distortion in your cartridge. That's right after the word cartridge. So what you've got to do is this. When you get home, if your Nintendo's messed up, you've got to pull the cartridge out, and the first step is this. Who remembers? You don't you, you you slam it first. You slam the cartridge as hard as you can. Remember this, Michael? So, all right. You slam it. And if the slam does not work, you pull the cartridge out, you hold it to your face, and you blow into it like <laughs> because saliva cures everything. Distortion comes because I leave something on pause. Here's what many of us do. There comes a point in your faith life, in your life where Jesus saves you. I'll never word it another way. He saves you. He saves you. Fifth grade, butter cookies. i got to be careful what I say about the Kool-Aid because I got in trouble at VBS this year. But Jesus saves you. And at some point in this, whether it's middle school or high school or whatever, things go bad. You're in middle school and you look around and no one else is living out their faith, really. So you put your faith on pause. Waiting to get to high school, because that's when people really begin to make good decisions. You get to high school and you look around and, and everybody's faith is still on pause, right? I'll get to college and that's when I'll straighten this up. And now what's taking place is not only do you have distortion, you have distortion in the way you understand how to fix it. I'll fix it myself when I get to college. Have you looked around the college campus? You're there. You get busy. They keep throwing papers at you. We'll straighten this out when I get to have a job. You've been far away for a long time. You get married. We'll fix it now. You just don't. You keep saying you're going to, 
fix something that you can't fix. Getting away from the way in which you fix it, which is the idea that Jesus is the one who fixes everything. There comes a day when you guys have these creatures called children. And you look at them and you're like, what do we do with them? They never get out of my face. So you decide, because you've heard about this building down the road called a church. And you heard they'll watch your kids for three hours on Sunday if you'll sit there quietly. You sit in the sanctuary. You begin to sing songs. Some of those songs are even familiar. But it's having to unpack all that distortion that's rested in your heart. The preacher starts talking. Says things that you know, but there's all this distortion, all these problems that have been created. Because you, who may have had a sincere faith, you've just not been living that faith. And for some of us in here, that story works and we never leave church on Sunday. We get to a place where we think, man, I, I don't need Jesus. Because I can do this. Listen, we can play church and do program. and We can do all the stuff that we do as a church. But if we've got people who are missing Jesus, then we miss Him. We failed you and you failed your family. Because we get away from Jesus and central, then we get away from the, the, the whole purpose of the Bible. But we shouldn't get together. You weren't created to live your life in this distorted faith. The work of God in you for salvation is one where He says, You're, you need me. This whole idea of I am comes from the book of Exodus when Moses talks to a bush, which is a problem in and of itself. But after he talks to the bush, eventually God says to him through the bush, I am who I am, which is basically what Jesus just said here. Or we could say it like this, you're in need, and I'm what you need. We get to John 6 that we dealt with together for a, few, for a couple weeks, and here's what we find. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. It's not just a matter of you needing bread. I, I am the bread. I'm just not going to feed you. I'm what you need to digest. I'm what you need. I'm the light of the world. You're in darkness and you need light. You don't just need me to give you light. You need to know that I am the light. You're in need and I'm what you need. Church family, if we get away from the idea that we need Jesus and think we can do this ourselves without Him, then all that does is create this distortion. And here's the sad part. For us, we get woes very much like these Pharisees because the idea of us doing Christianity without Christ that's damning. And it may say something to our hearts about something we've missed altogether. We really do need Jesus. You need Him in your family. You need Him in your, you need him in your workplace. And not just superficial sense. You, you really need... I can't do this without you. So here's what I want to do today. I want to ask you guys just to stand with me. I'm going to ask you to bow your head. My friend Mike is going to come and he's going to just play a song.